seeing you moving forward. I think Lou, uh, um, Nikki is going to really bring a lot of fun to the table. She's got a great sense of humor um, in addition to her great leadership skills. So we're delighted to have her taking the reins of our directorate. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and so many of you have probably seen our fleet chart before. This is one of these shock and awe charts, right? Because there's many, many missions on here. There's nearly 150 missions represented here in all phases from formulation all the way through extended operations. I think the number actually is like 146 or 147, but um, nearly 150. So we do great science at NASA in partnership with all of you and partners around the world. Um, just starting with the upper left, you know, representing astrophysics. So just sharing, you know, a couple of highlights from this past year, as well as looking forward to next year as I walk through this chart. I mean, James Webb Space Telescope, what an extraordinary year it was last year, and we're really just beginning. The amazing science that we're just learning about totally transforming our knowledge of our universe. So super exciting there. Moving off to the right with the sun, our favorite star. Um, here, here we are kicking off the heliophysics big year in FY23, beginning with the annular solar eclipse in October. And that's, I, many of you may know that we're also going into solar max. So it's a really exciting time for the sun. We're already seeing a lot of uh, solar flares and all. And, you know, we know that it has impacts for us here on earth as well as our spacecraft on orbit. Moving it back to the bottom left, Earth, you know, the planet that's probably the most important to us since it sustains our life. We are kicking off our Earth System Observatory with many of the projects moving into phase A. And we just delivered the NISAR mission to India for launch later. So super excited about that mission as well. And then up to the moon, some of y'all's favorite uh, planetary bodies. So with the moon, we obviously had the great success from Artemis, our biological and physical science activities, as well as heliophysics and planetary science, really important for our studies on the moon. And then on to Mars and our other planets, where I am super, super excited to see the OSIRIS-REx um, delivery of samples back to Earth later this fall in September. So great time for science. It really truly is an activity that brings the world together. And so thank you all for participating in that. This is a couple of other highlights of our upcoming milestones in 23 this next year. So again, you know, science never sleeps. It's always an exciting time for science. We had a great year last year. We're going to have a great year this year. And I'm just going to mention one thing in each of the rows. So uh, we're looking forward to our probes announcement of opportunity for astrophysics coming up. We're also on biological physical sciences, really big year for them because we are getting the updated decadal survey, which is going to set our strategy moving forward tied to, you know, com commercial lunar destinations and the, and the transformation from ISS to these commercial platforms. So very exciting time for BPS. Earth Science, we're getting ready to uh, launch the Tempo mission and the Tropics mission. Very important Earth Science missions, both looking at pollution as well as um, advancing our understanding of, of hurricanes. Heliophysics, um, I mentioned the Heliophysics big year, but we're also looking forward to announcing uh, the dynamic announcement of opportunity. And then finally, planetary science. Uh, we're We've got the amazing CLIPS missions to look forward to. So the first time, we're, so we're using commercial lunar uh, payload services. Joel's gonna tell you more about this, but first time that we're actually delivering landers, the US is delivering landers to the moon since the Apollo era. And we're doing it in partnership with industry. So super fun, super exciting times. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Glaze. Thanks so much, Sandra, and happy Pi Day to everybody. And it's always awesome to be at LPSC, my favorite, favorite meeting to ever go to. And it's just like my family coming back here and getting to see everyone. And so just great to be here. Before I um, kind of kick off and start uh, walking through some of the updates for Planetary Science Division, I wanted to ask everybody in the room who's from Headquarters Planetary Science Division to stand up. Stand up, 
Michael, you can stand up too, SMD. There we go. These are the people that send you money, okay? Thank you. So make sure when you see them in the hallway, you ask them to send you more. And uh, now they're, they're all there. They, they work incredibly hard to enable all of the amazing work that we do within Planetary Science Division. So thank you to all of you. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I have the clicker. Ah, ah, tricky. All right, so this is the actually, um, of those 140 some odd missions that Sandra showed up there, um, and the five science divisions at NASA headquarters, 40 of those are within planetary science division. So again, we have just an incredible portfolio of, of missions that are providing new data and, and really, again, just an incredible time for planetary science with this amazing uh, fleet that we have. I'm just gonna point out two things on this chart. I hope that some folks were able to attend the DART session yesterday, as well as the, the mission in the afternoon on InSight results. You'll see DART and InSight are still on the fleet chart, but they have little angel wings up there. Um, we're keeping them on the chart because there's still science ongoing on those two missions, um, and we'll be uh, probably closing those out relatively soon, but uh, both amazing missions with incredible science results. All right, I'm going to talk about budget real quickly. When I had to submit my slides last week, um, I could only talk about the uh, appropriation for fiscal year 2023. And what you can see here on the enacted budget uh, that we're working under right now, uh, that planetary science uh, was appropriated $3.2 billion. That's a 2.5% growth over last year. Um, that's uh, actually $40 million above what we asked for through the president's request, which is great. Um, but uh, note that there are still, we have a lot of constraints in our, in our budget uh, that we need to cover. There were some increases to Dragonfly and to the Near-Earth Object Surveyor. And so there is still a little bit of a gap between what our needs are and what the uh, appropriation was, but we're working through those in the um, operating plan process. And once all that's approved, we, as always, will make all of that operating plan budget available to everyone. Um, just yesterday, you probably heard that the fiscal year 2024 president's budget request came out. So this is the budget that will now go to the Hill for Congress to consider um, for the appropriation for next year. Um, so I can talk just very top level about that fiscal year 2024 request, the request that goes to Congress. Within that uh, budget, there's uh, overall, again, great support for Planetary Science Division at a level of $3.383 billion for planetary science. It's 183 million more. Thank you. 183 million more than the appropriated amount for this year. Um, so we're, we're continuing to um, ask Congress to provide the incredible support that they have for planetary. Um, let's hope that that, that, that support continues. Uh, within that at fiscal year 24 request, uh, there's an increase to the research and analysis budget. There's funding uh, for NEO surveyor that's consistent with what we confirmed that mission at in November for fiscal year 24 and out. Um, there is increased funding for Mars sample return in fiscal year 2024, I will note, however, when you look at the details of the budget, the out years for Mars sample return um, are still not quite what they need to be. The, we've got the request for 24, but, but not further out that we had requested. Um, let's see, there's increased funding for Psyche to support the new launch date in October. Um, there's increased funding to support Viper, which also had a delayed um, launch to fiscal year 2024, or into 20, calendar year 2024, and Joel will probably talk about that a little bit. There's funding to support Artemis III and beyond with science. Uh, it significantly expands NASA's support for the ESA Rosalind Franklin mission, which some of you know uh, was supposed to launch last year, but owing to complications in the Ukraine, um, ESA needed to stand down. Um, and we're looking for some additional help from NASA to help with that mission, including uh, the descent engines for the lander, radioisotope power systems, and a launch vehicle. And so we're, we're looking to help with that to get that mission to fly. 
Unfortunately, as I said, we've got a, a great budget here, but we still can't quite fit everything in. And so the budget that you'll see um, does eliminate uh, our investments in the dynamic radioisotope power systems and the associated technologies. Um, and this, the budget also you'll see um, includes the delay uh, to the Veritas uh, launch to no earlier than 2031. And I wanted to, while I was mentioning this, I see a whole collection of Veritas team members right in front. It's good to see you all here. I wanted to correct something that I said at the PAC meeting a few weeks back since I had this opportunity. And that is at that time, they were, we were talking about the criteria required for the restart for Veritas. Many of you know, um, in the fall, we delayed Veritas mission, as I mentioned, to no earlier than 2031 launch. And we were talking about what is required to restart Veritas in 2025. And some of the criteria, the first criteria is that I need to make sure we secure the funding for that, which I'm working on, um, just to mention that I've asked the community to provide feedback on priorities related to next discovery calls in support of, of the, ex, you know, the um, selected mission, the discovery mission, Veritas. We've got a lot of great support from the community uh, to restart Veritas, even if that means not um, holding the next discovery call. So I just wanna mention that that's the feedback I've gotten from the community. I've heard it loud and clear. Um, so my job is to get that funding secured uh, for the restart. The project's gonna provide us with a budget in the budget planning process this spring that'll lay out what's required um, for that launch scenario. Another requirement is that in response to the Psyche Independent Review Board report that came out, we need JPL to demonstrate that they are making progress towards some of the issues that were identified. There's an interim uh, assessment coming up this month and then a, an assessment in 2024. The correction that I wanted to make is that at the PAC meeting, I indicated the, the third criteria is that Europa Clipper and NISAR need to stay on schedule and launch on schedule. It is true that that is the third criteria. It has been the third criterion since uh, the decision was made in the fall. The incorrection, the correction I need to make is that at the PAC meeting, I claimed that I had said that at the uh, in, uh, Independent Review Board Town Hall. I went back and listened to all two hours of it and the words never crossed my lips. So. I am gonna apologize for that, uh, that I misspoke. Uh, it is a criterion, it was not made clear at that time, but just wanna make sure that folks know that. Um, let's move on. I'm gonna kind of fly through some of these because we have limited amount of time here today, but I wanna provide some updates on what's going on. Uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance Rover continues to do amazing things on Mars. We've collected, um, a bunch of samples now. We've placed 10 diverse samples, scientifically diverse samples on the surface of Mars as a backup cache so that we know a safe place to land at the, at the floor uh, of Jezero Crater near the front of the Delta. We know we can land there safely. We know we have 10 samples there that, that represent a diverse um, set of geology in, in Jezero. Um, and so as a backup, we know we can go there and get those 10 samples. However, we also have pairs of each of those 10 on the rover. We're continuing to collect samples, um, hopefully up to as many as 30 or 31. And then wherever Perseverance ends up, our primary goal is to land the Mars sample return lander near Perseverance. So all that full cache of 31 samples or 30 samples can get loaded on and returned back. So we've got great progress there. You can see here those 10 samples on the surface of Mars um, sitting there waiting quietly um, until maybe they get picked up or maybe we collect the ones on the rover and they just sit there as a, as a relic on the surface. A uh, quick update on Psyche and Janus. I've already mentioned briefly that the Psyche mission to visit the asteroid 16 Psyche, the metallic asteroid, that mission in the fall, we, uh, we agreed to uh, delay that launch until this year, um, until October 5 is when the launch window opens. And so that is moving forward. Uh, the, the project is making very good progress towards um, being ready for that launch in October. Spacecraft is down at Kennedy Space Center. It's right now kind of in a maintenance mode, kind of storage, but we go in and check on it periodically. In June, it'll kind of go back into the assembly test and launch operations mode, uh, where we start to prepare it for integration onto the rocket and launch in October. 
Um, I did want to mention Janice, which was the Simplex rideshare that was supposed to ride with Psyche. The new launch window, unfortunately, does not allow the Psyche spacecraft to achieve their level one science objectives. And so they have been demanifest from Psyche. Europa Clipper. Um, what an incredible mission this is going to be to, to fly to uh, Jupiter or go into orbit around Jupiter and then uh, execute multiple flybys of Jupiter's moon Europa. You can see all kinds of hardware down there in the images. The assembly test and launch operations are really picking up speed. You can watch them live on the webcam. If you like, um, most of the instruments are, are delivered and being integrated. Um, there's another one being delivered in a couple weeks, the narrow angle camera for the um, Europa imaging system just leaves a couple left. And, and so we're really uh, starting to march forward at a, at a pretty fast pace uh, with expectation of launch in October of 2024 and arrival at Jupiter in April of 2030. Uh, and speaking of Jupiter and its moons, Euro, uh, the European uh, Space Agency's mission, JUICE, to explore Callisto, Europa, and Ganymede um, is actually right on the verge of launching. In fact, one month from yesterday is the launch date for JUICE from Kourou, French Guiana. The spacecraft is down there uh, being integrated and getting ready to go. So keep an eye out for that one. They're going to be launching in April uh, with an arrival uh, in the Jupiter system in 2031. And of course, NASA has uh, contributions to three of, the uh, three of the instruments on the payload for JUICE. I wanna talk about New Horizons uh, for a moment. Uh, the New Horizons mission went through a senior review last year. Uh, that review uh, began in, in February. Uh, the results, uh, the report from the senior review process, just to know that it was a multidisciplinary review um, of the, the proposal that came from that team, looking at astrophysics, heliophysics, and planetary science objectives. The report from the senior review was delivered to the Planetary Science Division last April. Um, at the same time, in parallel, astrophysics and heliophysics also looked at the proposal and provided their assessments. Um, there was a selection letter that went to the team in May, uh, but the decision then continued following that letter um, owing to a reconsideration request um, submitted by the team. And then the final decision uh, that was signed off by Thomas Zubuk and was sent um, in August. And the content of that um, essentially uh, was based on the uh, senior review materials, which are available online that you can, can go look at, uh, but basically indicated that there's a lot of great heliophysics science that can be done with the spacecraft. There's some astrophysics that can be done, uh, but as far as planetary science, uh, the report states that uh, there's no major strengths for planetary science. Um, did include one minor strength, are related to observations of the dwarf planets, Uranus and Neptune. And then uh, one major weakness that the Kuiper Belt object studies are unlikely to dramatically improve our state of knowledge. So based on that, we are funding it through 2024 to support the planetary science, helio and astro objectives. Um, but we really wanna make sure that the spacecraft is being used going forward beyond that. It's a healthy spacecraft and in the interest of our science communities and taxpayers and, and, the, and the team itself, we wanna make sure there's an opportunity there in the future. Um, and so to that end, Astrophysics Planetary are collaborating with Helio to put out a request for information. It should be coming out soon, looking for ideas for how to use the science to use the spacecraft going forward. Um, it's gonna be open, as I said, a lot of great science already identified for heliophysics, but the RFI will be open for other ideas as well. So keep an eye out for that. And with that, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Joel for a few minutes and then I'll be back after he talks about Lunar. Thank you, it's uh, great to be back and it's great to see everyone here. Um, I thought 2022 was a really expanding year for exploration science of the moon because a lot of things started that you're gonna see shape things for the years uh, coming up. 
So for example, KPLO, uh, KPLO Denori um, launched and went into lunar orbit and then included um, shadow cam to help shed light and images from uh, PSRs. Um, NASA's Space Technician Directorate um, in partnership with industry launched the capstone comm position navigation and timing small set that's going to be the same near rectilinear halo orbit that Gateway will go into. And right now it's working with MRO. Um, the um, iSpace's Hakuta R Mission 1 um, launched and it's due to land on the lunar surface this spring, probably in April. And on that same launch, a lunar flashlight um, launch. But I'm gonna save two things for the end. The first, of course, was the flight test of Artemis 1, which tested uh, many uh, systems like Orion and the Space Launch System rocket, which is gonna enable astronaut explorer um, um, investigation science on the South Pole of the Moon. And also uh, we received a uh, planetary science and astrobiology decadal survey, Origins, uh, Worlds and Life in uh, 2022, which is gonna, which provides some very specific recommendations on lunar discovery and exploration, as well as the generation and integration of science objectives and requirements into the Artemis effort. All of that is really going to affect things in the years um, coming up. In addition, I'll mention is that NASA spent quite a bit of time and many of you provided input to NASA on this to draft the set of objectives for um, Moon and Mars, well, which we often call Moon to Mars, um, activities um, particularly related to human spaceflight for the years coming up uh, from now all the way out to um, the first uh, landing by humans on Mars. And you're gonna see uh, in this year coming up how that is um, being used to look at midterm and the out term, what type of systems and functions NASA will have to enable those objectives. But let me say a few things about lunar discovery and exploration uh, for coming, uh, coming up that I put on the chart. Um, one, you know, lunar trailblazer is making um, great progress. It will launch uh, with um, the intuitive machine's second uh, clips mission um, coming up at the end of this year. Um, the Viper um, rover, which as Lori pointed out last year was rescheduled from a landing in late 23 to late 24, has gone through its systems integration review and is starting assembly. Uh, but probably I would think, think that the thing that'll be very visible to people in the community is that the first two CLPS landings are scheduled by those companies to take place this summer. The Astrobotic Technologies in Pittsburgh, along with the United Launch Alliance, has announced that their target launch date for their program mission one first CLPS delivery is in May. Uh, that will also be on the first um, launch of the new uh, Vulcan Center United Launch Alliance uh, rocket. And Intuitive Machines has announced that their first CLPS delivery um, to Malapert A um, using their Nova C vehicle will be this June. So it followed that up, as I mentioned, their second um, intuitive machines landing is targeted for the end of this year. And that is the mission that Lunar Trailblazer will ride share with um, to go to the moon. Um, looking at um, activities um, related to preparing for um, getting, uh, having science accomplished by human explorers, uh, you probably know that the Artemis III science geology team call is out and step two proposals are due at uh, the end of April. Um, also come upcoming will be the um, draft uh, solicitation for the Artemis deployed instrument call that'll be coming out soon. That's listed on the bottom um, of the chart. And also based on the planetary science and astrobiology decadal survey, effort is being put into um, defining and refining missions concepts and soon going out to the community to refine and define science objectives and requirements for the Endurance A mission uh, to bring samples back from South Paul Aiken Basin. And I also listed here that um, the PRISM-3 step two proposals were in and the selections will be made this summer. And you're probably aware in response to advice that we were given again from the decadal survey by the Planetary Advisory Committee and the League, um, we structured PRISM-3 um, so that the proposer is proposing the landing site in addition to the investigation, the instrument suite, which is new, and uh, we think will probably uh, lead to um, even higher value investigations than we've seen in the earlier uh, solicitations. We've had um, eight um, clips um, landings on contract. We're getting ready very soon to announce uh, the ninth one. You'll notice in this chart, we list one of the landings uh, outlined in yellow, which is the one that Mast and Space Systems was gonna do for us. 
Masters, as you all know, went into Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And because of that, we uh, strongly believe they won't be able to deliver on their clips delivery. It's the Department of Justice that deals with um, companies that go into Chapter 11. And um, Masters, the state and the Department of Justice are very close to resolving um, Masters' uh, forward uh, position and whether any buyers or additional buyers are coming forward who might, for example, offer to conduct Masters' um, previously awarded clips landings. We don't believe there will be any offers like that. And we believe this will probably be settled this month or next month, at which point you won't see the Masters landing, which was called Task Order 19C, on our uh, moon map manifest uh, anymore. Um, I want to point out that we've heard of the community um, over the past year really asked for an integrated lunar science strategy, which looks at the um, recommendations from the recent decadal survey, as well as the opportunities afforded by human exploration systems and robotic systems to outline uh, what the different strategies are for accomplishing the strategic research topics and the major scientific questions in the decadal survey. Planetary Science Division and SCO are continuing to build that strategy so it can be published for community comments and review. And um, I also want to point out um, here that there's a couple of very specific things we're looking at along with that strategy in the near term. One is to take a look at a community study for what the advantages would be of landing the human systems with the astronaut explorers at locations on the moon other than just the South Pole. Also, um, the detailed refinement by the community input for the Endurance A, uh, science objectives, requirements, and mission. And also, I think you'll hear about in the League Town Hall work that's being done to look at a one uh, architecture of a successor, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And um, there's also a study um, coming up, a joint League and um, XMEG study on Artemis samples. Now, I hope this gives you an idea why I think 2023 is going to be an even bigger and more exciting year uh, for lunar science and exploration than 2022 was. And 2022 uh, really set the foundation for what you're going to see in the future. So I think you're going to think it's a really exciting year. And I'm going to turn it back over to Lori. Thanks for uh, putting up with our tag team here. So i got a few more things I just wanted to talk about uh, relatively uh, quickly here. Um, first, uh, let's talk about some of the RNA updates. I'm not going to go through and read this whole slide, of course, because Stephen's going to give you a whole town hall on Thursday where you can go and ask him as many questions as you want. You can ask them today if you like, but uh, I'm not going to walk through this one. The main thing I'm going to point out on this slide is right down there in the middle of the slide, you can see it says reduced proposal pressure, fewer proposals, uh, ROSES 21 and ROSES 22. Uh, we're seeing fewer proposals being submitted uh, relative to uh, the number that were submitted in 2020 to ROSES 20. Uh, Stephen and I have been giving this message out uh, for the last year um, to try and encourage people because if you want to have a good chance of getting your RNA proposal funded, now is a good time. We've been saying this for a year and proposal pressure has not gone up yet. Okay, so if you have a good idea, a good research idea that you wanna submit, get it in before everybody else beats you to it. So um, a couple other things I wanted to meet, uh, mention on this slide are, um, number one, the summer undergraduate program for planetary research. I, I got an email from, from Tracy Gregg. Stand up, Tracy, so everybody can see you. Tracy Gregg, yep, everybody in the room. Everybody online, her email is tgregg at buffalo.edu. Um, she said I could give you that, it's okay. Um, so uh, Tracy runs the Summer Undergraduate Program for Planetary Research. Uh, it's an eight-week program for undergrads majoring in geology or related field work. Um, they work with uh, anybody who's funded through Solar System Workings. If you have a funding, uh, a grant or a project through SSW, it can be on a no-cost extension, whatever you have. Um, if you have one of those, um, you are eligible to be a mentor. And what I, the information I'm getting from Tracy is that we have like 
over 100 interns that really want to participate. They put in their applications, but we need mentors for these interns. Um, and I believe that the deadline for you as a mentor to submit your interest in having an intern um, is this Friday. So make sure if you have an interest, contact Tracy um, and make sure you have an SSW grant and then uh, let her know. Uh, all good. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention, Stephen said to mention, is that just how recently did the PAC call go out? Last week? Uh, last week, there was an open call that went out uh, to solicit new members for our Planetary Advisory Committee. Um, so definitely encouraging um, anyone who has never served on that committee. Uh, this is an opportunity to... Uh, to, to have a say in, in uh, how what we're doing at NASA headquarters in Planetary Science Division and, and uh, be engaged at that highest level of, um, of advice uh, with, the, with the agency. Um, and hopefully you had time to read through a lot of that. Um, I thought I would mention uh, the principal investigator or PI launch pad. Uh, we ran a couple of these, one before the pandemic, one virtually kind of in the middle of the pandemic. And we're now ready to run this third instantiation of PI Launchpad. We've got incredibly positive feedback on this program. It's intended towards um, individuals who have less experience on flight projects. So not necessarily specifically early career. It's actually anyone in any stage of their career who really wants to get more engaged or consider writing mission proposals. Um, it's a great opportunity to learn more about the uh, flight uh, project process and what's required to write a successful mission proposal. I know we've had a lot of planetary participation um, in this program in the past, and so I'm hoping that we dominate again because we're so awesome. So definitely uh, check out, uh, applications are due in April, check out the website there, and if this is something that interests you, please participate. I also wanted to just give a quick shout out for our Here to Observe program. I don't know if anyone was in the, the session this morning um, on the, the more inclusive and diverse community of the future. Uh, David Smith at NASA headquarters runs this program. We've been running it in a pilot phase for the last two years, two academic calendar years, um, where we've paired uh, universities uh, that are uh, educating undergraduate students that are from populations underrepresented within our science community, um, pairing those universities and those undergraduate students and faculty with some of our flight projects. So we've got University of Puerto Rico uh, partnered with Clipper and Virginia State now partnered with, um, with Dragonfly. This has been really successful. Right now, we're, we're getting ready to roll out um, an expansion of this program to additional flight projects within Planetary Science Division. Some of them are oper in operations, some still in development, and then a new uh, ROSES call to um, solicit the university partners. Um, it's a really cool program. I don't have time to talk about it here. David Smith at NASA headquarters, if you want more information on that one. Uh, quickly on the bridge program, there's a QR code if you want to get a lot more information. This is science mission directorate wide, much broader than planetary program to connect um, institutions that have been historically under resourced by NASA. Um, connecting those institutions with uh, R1's large research institutions and NASA centers, um, really trying, again, to try and diversify uh, the, the, um, the science and engineering and STEM community that feeds into our NASA, NASA programs of the future. Um, so they're looking the, for partnerships that focus on transitioning undergraduate students into uh, graduate schools or employment at NASA and related institutions, looking for faculty development and paid undergraduate student positions. Uh, again, there's contact information here. If this is something that interests you, please, uh, please learn more. And then I am probably going to wrap this up. I think I meant it under my time, maybe. I don't know. Okay, good, because I wanted to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. Um, I try not to overload with too much one-way information. This is really a two-way town hall. It really needs to be a, a dialogue. But before I stop, I have a couple more slides. This one here is things to watch coming up. You already heard from Joel that um, we are finally going to get our first CLIPS launches, the first one maybe as soon as May. Uh, so that is really uh, an exciting time uh, to really see how this grand experiment of commercial lunar payload services is really going to work and hopefully get that capability so we can get more science at the moon. 
Got the juice launch coming up in less than a month. I already mentioned that. Um, in the fall, in September, uh, we've got OSIRIS-REx, the samples coming back, being delivered to the Utah Test and Training Range, and then immediate transport to Johnson Space Center so we can start getting the amazing science from those samples returned from asteroid Bennu. And then just this morning, if anybody was paying attention, there's a new U.S. Postal Service stamp just released this morning uh, for OSIRIS-REx sample return. So pretty cool. Go OSIRIS-REx. I'll also mention here, um, talking about OSIRIS-REx, that once those samples are delivered back here to Earth, the spacecraft is going to continue on um, under new spacecraft leadership. Uh, Dani Delagostina from Air University of Arizona is going to take over the uh, PI ship for the spacecraft um, and take it on a new mission to go explore Apophis, the asteroid Apophis, um, in 2029 is that encounter, uh, while Dante will stay uh, here on Earth uh, leading the sample uh, analysis activities. I uh, already mentioned Clipper Atlo is going on, uh, mentioned the Psyche launch coming up in October, and then also finally just to mention Discovery at 30. Uh, there's going to be some information coming out relatively soon on what that means, hopefully some symposia and some activities to really celebrate this incredible science um, program. And then I'm going to leave this one up here. I'm not going to talk to all of these, but these are all of the events that are happening this week. I really want to encourage people to go to these town halls. Um, for various things, uh, information that you might want to know. In particular, I'm going to point out the Transform to Open Science or TOPS workshops. Uh, there was a town hall yesterday uh, that was led um, uh, by our, our uh, open science folks from NASA headquarters. Um, they're also leading workshops that can help you learn how to implement open, sci open source science in all of your work. Um, I know some folks have looked at some of the requirements that have come out in the new policy directives, and it's kind of intimidating. Um, so these are your opportunity to really uh, learn, learn more. Uh, so there's workshops. There was one this morning. There's a workshop this afternoon, and there's two workshops tomorrow. If you want to sign up for them, I'm told you can go to the LPI electronic bulletin board, and it's under events, LPI events. NASA events, sorry, um, on the far left, it says NASA events. You can scroll down, find TOPS workshops, and learn about how you can make all your data, software, everything um, open for the community. And I think I'll just leave that one up there. And I think we're all here available for, for questions. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, we have plenty of time for dialogue. Uh, those of you who want to ask a question, come up to the mic, uh, state your name and affiliation. Uh, um, uh, those of you who are online, if you can submit to the Q&A uh, and uh, we'll uh, moderate and uh, uh, work through the, the ballrooms here. So if you'd like to start. <laughs> Hi, Lori. Hi, Sue. I, I know you're doing a lot of great things, but unfortunately, I have to bring you back to the not so great thing because mm -hmm. uh, this mission that was on track is being uh, like effectively martyred for all of those missions that are going over budget. And there are many, not only at JPL. And um, before I forget, I, I want to, um, I think you misspoke about uh, restarting Veritas because you said 25. Mm -hmm. I've, been uh, told that uh, it's not 25, it's 26. That's what your staff told me. Okay. So there's another moving target as to when we can restart. But I think people need to understand, uh, m many people here at the conference should understand that it's not a simple delay. And that, um, you know, based on the psyche issues identified, workforce, the psyche overrun, I, I could have seen uh, justifying a year maybe two years, but this plus three years has nothing to do with the IRB. It has nothing to do with JPL workforce or the psyche overruns. So that's a whole nother deal that cannot be justified in that way. And, um, you know, I think people have to understand that it's not a simple delay. All of our engineering funding has been taken mm -hmm. away. 
which means the team that in some cases has been working over 10 years on this mission, you know, the very experienced team that was a problem for Psyche to assemble is being disbanded. And those, you know, five people in that area that we had working on Veritas, that the Psyche IRB related fields, they're not gonna help Clipper, they're not gonna help Psyche, and um, they're certainly not gonna go to India to help NISAR. So, you know, there's, um, part of it can be justified based on Psyche and the IRB, but um, the complete stand down, this greater than three year delay, it's um, beyond any of those issues. So I think the community has to understand that. And, you know, the reason that so many in the community are outraged by this are these facts that, you know, a mission that was on track is being uh, put contingent upon earth science missions and all kinds of other things that have nothing to do with us. So anyone who wants to be a PI or be on a PI led mission is pretty outraged about how this is going down. So um, I, I hope it's 25 and not 26. So, uh, you know, the, the, the goalpost just keeps moving and the budget keeps moving and it's just, you know, it's, um, it's a, a much more complicated and dire situation than I think the community realizes. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Uh, Mark Robinson, Arizona State University. Um, that was a uh, <clears throat> hard to listen to, but let's, I'll move to the question I had. What was the question? <laughs> oh, I know. Um, I'm curious about, and I don't know if you guys have insight into this or not, but the Orion heat shield problem and what effect that's going to have on Artemis 2 and Artemis 3. I think everybody's worried that Artemis 2 is now going to become a reflight of Artemis 1. And it's going to put the whole you know, human return to the moon off by three or four years, something along those lines. Because uh, there, there, there was an announcement very early on about the issue, but that maybe I missed it because I don't have enough time to spend looking at the so, web all the time. Joel, yeah, I'm just gonna... curious what the, what the status yeah. of that issue is. Well, first thing I'd say is I think Jake Bleacher is here, so I really got to turn it over to Jake in um, ESDM. Day. Oh, passing the buck. But, but um, I will tell you that um, that um, I don't think any of us know the, the, the technical details of it, but I believe that what the agency just said this past week, or maybe it was next week, that after reviewing the results on Orion and SLS and the ground system elements, that people are pretty confident pressing forward on the plan to do the um, human um, lunar flyby mission at the end of 2024. Is that right, Jake? I mean, that's the last uh, thing I heard. And I mean, I had spoken to Jim Free very recently and he'd repeated the same thing to me. Oh, that's great. I haven't heard anything about, for example, turning Artemis II into a repeat of Artemis I or anything like that. Yeah, I would say that there's an Artemis town hall tomorrow that oh, you uh, can go to for okay. a lot of details. Yeah, hi, uh, Jan Halbert from DLR, and I'm the lead on the Venus Emissivity Mapper on Veritas. And I have a general question just for the budgets, because I, I, I don't understand how NASA budget systems work. Because when we had to apply for the mission at DLR, I had to come up with a budget request. I had to have a written statement. That is the budget we need, and I had to guarantee it. It was defined that it was other things were not done because they were money allocated for Veritas. Uh, and now I'm in the situation where I have actually exactly as much money as the whole Veritas mission on the US side, which is really weird and puts us in a very strange situation because now we're basically needing to come up with extra money to cover money left from the US side. Uh, and uh, I, I just don't understand how the system works, why we had to be pushed on being on time, on money, on everything. And the US side just basically just said, there's zero money available, sorry. Yeah, so I'll, I'll speak to that, Jorn, and, and I appreciate the comments, and I, I, I understand that it's very frustrating. Now, I'm, I am also going to mention that 
you know, we go through this in both directions. So when missions on the ESA side get delayed, we also end up having to fund those and find ways to support those. So this kind of happens both ways. Um, it's not always a one-way thing. I understand that this is a much more extreme example and I, I'm not trying to belittle your question in any way. Um, I'll go back and I, I didn't go through all of the, the discussion here because we've talked about it several times in several fora, but I'll, I'll go through it again that uh, there was a variety of things that set the context even before the Psyche IRB was released. Um, so within the planetary budget, I can't go ask for more money in the current year. Um, the money we have is the money that we have. And within the budgets we've had to live in, in, in fiscal year 2020, 21, 22, and now 23, um, we've had to accommodate um, a lot of impacts due to COVID in the on you know in the numbers of in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay, um, all of that was absorbed within the planetary budget without any other you know other penalties. That so we were able to keep missions on schedule. We launched 2020 on schedule. We launched Lucy on schedule, we launched DART on schedule, and so we absorbed those, um, those COVID impacts that had to be absorbed. Um, we've also uh, had to absorb, uh, over the last couple of years, many missions that have come in that have gone to launch with higher than anticipated phase E costs. Um, so phase E, for anyone that doesn't know, that's the operational costs for the missions. So when you come to the point where we're like uh, two months away from launch and the missions come in and say, we've got this wonderful spacecraft, it's completely ready, it's ready to go, but it's going to cost you several hundred million dollars or tens of you know, millions of dollars more in order to get the science back that we've got this mission, we're going to spend the money in order to get that. So we've absorbed that as well. We're also absorbing now at this point, as we're looking at the missions in development on the heels of COVID, now we have supply chain issues where every single mission that's in development is coming in and saying, this is across the board. This is not planetary. This is worldwide. It's everywhere. Um, every single mission is coming in and saying, uh, not only have the costs gone up on every single part that we need, but we now need significantly longer lead times in order to buy these parts. So that means the money that I had budgeted for 24 or 25, I now need it now, okay? So we're trying to absorb that as well. Um, and then on top of that, also rate increases due to inflation, which again, not unique to us, it's happening everywhere. So just in thinking about budget, that's kind of the budget situation where we were um, and where we are now um, in trying to address and, and keep that amazing portfolio that you saw um, with all of those missions, trying to keep that all going. And then with the, the Psyche Independent Review Board report that came back, um, indicated um, that at this time, there's an unprecedented amount of work at JPL specifically um, that was not just, and I recognize that, you know, one individual mission, one of these missions like Veritas doesn't have a lot of resource requirements. And yet there's so many of those missions at JPL that have these kind of low level requirements that it was stressing the system across the board. Um, so it's not just the big missions, but it's the number of the smaller missions that are there or the ones that have the smaller resource needs that were really stressing the system. So that you know, was the context for uh, the decision that was made. We've talked about this many times. Um, you know, like I, that's the decision that was made was to, uh, to delay a mission at JPL in order to uh, not only free up the resources, but also to free up the, the bandwidth in order to deal with the whole issues across JPL. So that, I mean, that's, um, that's the whole budget situation as I can, as I can tell you. I mean, COVID and inflation and longer lifetimes mm -hmm. and mission extension is not just NASA. It's on our side, the same thing. So it's a kind of, it's not a one side thing. It's on both sides that it is. the same situation. And so I understand. It's just pushing it on now on the European side. I understand. And I know that that's a challenge and, and we have been, you know, trying to interact with the European partners, um, you know, at least the agency levels. Um, to try and provide the support that we can uh, as far as, you know, trying to ensure that that we're, you know, kind of retain the partnership going forward. I understand that it costs more. Thank you. Hang on, please, Bill. Um, I'm going to ask about questions from the other room. Anyone? Speak um, up. Yes. Carrie Liss, APL. 
Could Thank you, you elaborate on the plans for Discovery 25 call? Is it currently delayed or is it still in the books? So right now what you're going to see in the budget is that Discovery 25 is, is in the budget. Um, but as I, as I noted, we do have a challenge and I've gotten pretty clear information from the community about the importance of, you know, continued support for selected missions in Discovery, um, you know, specifically Veritas. Um, we're fixing to go into our, you know, budget planning cycle. So we've heard from the community. We're going to look at where we are with the budget that we have um and and see what we can support and again that's that's kind of our job over the next several months is to see what that what that looks like thank you so that's really all i can say about that at this point yeah uh, bill mckinnon wash you um, hey, bill. Hi. um it is an amazing portfolio and i have a simple question but i also i guess i have a statement that figure from all this discussion i'll just say from you know past experience it's 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 really the job of everybody here to help you get the funding for Veritas. So I know you can't ask in a sense. So, but we can, we can, the Planetary Society can, our friends in Congress, whoever they might be. I mean, this is, this is the only reason we got to Pluto and we're going to Europa. Okay. True. So that's just my, my statement. Um, and I wish everyone luck. <laughs> know how much, how hard everyone's working to make this all come together. My, my statement is very simple because you had the list up there and I know there's a town hall, but in the out years in the, New Frontiers 5, is the budget wedge adequate? Or is that, do we have that detail? For New Frontiers 5 call. Yeah, yeah. well, to actually do it. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I do know what you're saying. And I know, there's going to be, I know we're, we're getting up, we're going to get the final AO, but yeah, still. We can, are, and you know, I'm looking at Kurt, and we think we have a profile. Yes, he's giving me a thumbs up um, that we have a, a profile that's going to support uh, the New Frontiers 5 call next year okay that's still the plan the, the next one in this room i have an um an online question from an anonymous attendee can you tell me more or us more about the potential recompete of the new horizon science team and the thought process behind what nasa is looking for yeah, I, I would be happy to. So as I said, you know, the, the spacecraft uh, is, in, is in good shape um, and I think still capable of delivering uh, good science for our science community. As I said, as, as, uh, as stewards of the taxpayer dollars, I think we, we want to make sure that that happens. Uh, so the, the RFI that will be coming out is looking for science ideas. I want to make clear that uh, we're not looking to recompete the, the operational team. We have an operational team, um, and so that would, would retain remain the same. The RFI is not a competition. It's actually looking for um, ideas for science that can be done with the spacecraft, and then uh, perhaps following that request for information, uh, there may be a solicitation that follows. Um, the, the ideas that can be submitted are not restricted, um, in any way, uh, to any of the, di the disciplines. I mentioned that through the senior review process, the heliophysics science was very, very well reviewed. Um, so I think that's an important data point, but we're not restricting the RFI to just heliophysics. It's open to astro or, or planetary as well. So there'll be more information on that as the RFI when it gets, the, hits the streets. Next one in this room then, thank you. Candy Hansen, PSI. Hi Candy. Hi, um, so my uh, comment and question concern radioactive power supplies. Mm -hmm. I have participated in OPEG studies and the decadal survey, the most recent one, the study that we did and the missions that are recommended in the decadal survey, the, the mm -hmm. new one. Our budget is very, very, very tight on both mm -hmm. plutonium and clads. So you can imagine my surprise to hear some of that very precious supply may be going to ExoMars. So let's be clear. I didn't say we're sending clads to ExoMars. It's what the, what the are RHUs. we sending? They're, they're radioisotope heating units. RHUs. Okay. RHUs. And if I said something otherwise. No, I wanted, I, that's I, part of the clarification that I wanted. Okay. Those are also pretty tight in supply. And we so, are re we are restarting the production. Eric, do you want to stand up and say something? I mean, Eric's the director me, for RPS. And let me wanna... just finish my actual mm -hmm. question because that was supposed to be commentary. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my actual question is: there is a way to boost the funding 
to get that program going faster. And so I was curious if the 2024 dollars include money for the RPS or RHU mm -hmm. um, to ExoMars. That's Eric, my why question. don't you go to the microphone and answer that one? So hi, I'm Eric Ayans. I'm Lori's deputy for planetary. I'm the I don't think the microphone's oh, picking you up. Yes. Yes. All right, let me go this way. I'll, I'll point that way. Uh, so I'm Eric Ayans. I'm, I'm Lori's deputy for uh, planetary overall, but I'm also the um, uh, the uh, program director for both uh, the Mars Exploration Program and uh, the RPS program. So uh, we are working with the Europeans to be able to provide um, uh, an amount of uh, RHUs uh, in order to be able to support their design. Um, the, uh, the budget that we have does support the restart of the RHU production line, and we're actually working with DOE on that restart, but we're gonna need those RHUs not only for uh, ExoMars, but also for Dragonfly and perhaps other applications as well. Oh, so, I know. It's so very short supply. That's so, my point. Yes, we, the, the inventory amount that we have is insufficient to be able to support all of our upcoming requirements. So we're restarting the production line. Yes, we're, we're, our, our, our constant rate production will support the needs that we have right now. At uh, 0.5 Yes, go to the microphone, Candy. Candy, please. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying to really pin him down on the numbers here. And <laughs> so I'm asking uh, the ramp up in plutonium production, PU-238. Um, is it right now it's at like 0.5? Are you going to go up to 1.5? I, I think we're at, uh, we're, we are we're ramping up, but not quite to that amount. I don't remember the exact numbers off the top. I'd have to go back. So to somewhere over. between 0.5 and 1.5? Yes. What, what's the number? 1.5 by 2026. Perfect. That's a great answer. Thank you, Lynn, our program executive. <laughs> Hi, Lori. Uh, Erwin Mazaiko from NASA Garland and Veritas. And so my question is about that new third criteria that you outlined, right? The, dependence on Clipper and NYSAR to launch on schedule. Can you explain the rationale for that? Because your second criterion is already budget. So is it something beyond the budget? Why, why draw a dependency sure. from an Earth science mission? So, so yeah, so let's, let's talk about that for a minute, Erwin. That's a good question, right? So we talked about, first, we got to make sure we have the funding, right? Which I'm, we're going to make sure we have some way, right? To get things restarted. Second one was to make sure that JPL is, is responding to the IRB findings in general, and then in particular, making sure that Europa Clipper and NYSAR stay on schedule. And I'll tell you why those are so important, and it's money, but it's not just money. It's, it's the capabilities and the resource availability at JPL, because imagine that if, just for the sake of argument, NYSAR has now sipped, shipped to India, so hopefully that's a big step. Europa Clipper still has a way to go to get to the 2024 launch. If Europa Clipper, for some reason, does not stay on schedule, and please, God, don't let that happen, but if it doesn't stay on schedule and we have to slip a Europa Clipper launch, that then ripples into Mars sample return and delays Mars sample return. And not only is that a lot of money, but it's also all of the people and the resources at JPL, test facilities, everything that are required to support every other mission on center. So it's absolutely critical that those two missions, NYSAR and, and Clipper, because they take a lot of resources on center, that they are the highest priority and that they're, they're moving to to get so off I, of planet I mean, Earth so that we can, can use those resources every place else. I mean, I do understand budget uh, impact, but why mm -hmm. would Veritas be treated differently than the rest of the portfolio in that case? I mean, I understand that would create problems and maybe delay new stocks, but why would Veritas then be canceled rather than just, you know, delay further or maybe, you know, discovery delayed further? I mean, why, why do you draw that canceled? No, no, but I mean, you say that it can only be restarted if NYSA and Clipper launch on time, right? So we can't restart on schedule at that time if NYSA and Clipper are still sitting. But I still don't understand yeah. why that's yeah. treated differently than just a budget impact for planetary or in general, and why Veritas is then treated differently than the rest of the portfolio. I hear your point. 
Um, this was part of the, the decision process just to try and, you know, to establish what, what the criteria were as we go forward, making sure that there's progress towards meeting. I will tell you that there are other things that are, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, making sure that we are making progress on those IRB findings, you know, without assigning new work, without, you know, looking at, at other things going on at JPL as well. So just to know it's not just, it's not just Veritas. Hi, Shannon Hibbard, JPL Caltech. So the International Mars Ice Mapper Measurement Definition Team came out with a report uh, presenting um, some promising results for some scientific value to come out of this uh, internationally collaborative, uh, relatively low cost mission uh, if, if NASA is involved. And that came out following the decadal survey. Um, our, are there any updates on NASA's roles or plans for the International Mars Ice Mapper mission? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it is a, a really appreciate the, the science um, measurement team that, that did a lot of work on that report. It's really great. They did good work. I don't know, Eric, did you, I, I mean, I'll let you speak to it if you prefer. Okay, well, I'll, I'll say a couple words and then Eric can come up and, and add or correct. But um, so where we are with that right now is we actually met with the, the prime international partners back, I think, before the holidays um, with um, uh, Italian Space Agency, Japanese Space Agency, and Canadian Space Agencies, who are the core um, international partners. Um, they've now, you know, in, in collaboration with, with, with us as well, with NASA, have really, I think, honed and refined the mission concept um, into something that looks like something that we might have an easier time um, participating in. However, as you have heard, the budget situation, even though it's growing and we've got a lot of support for the amazing things that we're doing, um, we still can't quite do everything. So we are um, kind of, you know, thinking about how we can participate, but we're not making any uh, financial commitments right now. So I don't know, Eric, did you wanna say it any further? Okay. Do you know yeah. when we might hear about a potential financial commitment, if, if there's a timeline for that, or if it's an, I don't know. Um, I'm gonna look at Eric, what the timeline is on that. It's in the Mars program, so. In, in, in discussion with um, uh, the other international partners, uh, it's looking like if NASA were needed, uh, or if NASA were to make a contribution, funding wouldn't be needed until about 2026. So in the, in the interim, we are collaborating with them on the, the potential for uh, what a partnership would look like. Great. Thank Does you. That, okay. Nancy, before we move on in this room, please let me ask, um, are there questions in Water Bay Ballroom 5 or 6? Yes. Hello? Okay. This is Deborah Domain. Okay, Planet then. <laughs> <laughs> May I? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. This is Deborah Domain, Planetary Science Institute. Um, I want to get back we, to we the subject of our um, commitments with our foreign partners and the impacts things like cancellations or delays have on them. And what is our priority? for honoring our commitments with our partnerships, building trust with our foreign partnerships, because delaying missions such as Veritas to this magnitude really betrays a trust that we are trying to solidly build with our foreign partners. Can you please address that? Yeah, and and I, I yeah, <laughs> this is a, this is tough. I agree that, and it's an area that uh, we certainly, you know, we really value those those international partnerships, and this one was really really hard. Um, I, as I've said a couple of times, I'll say it again here. There were no good solutions. We looked across the board at a bunch of different options, and and the Veritas delay was the option that we picked. There were there were, um, as I said there were no good options here. And I recognize that the international partnerships is a is one of the hardest parts of this because we do rely on those international partnerships and we do want to keep those those partnerships you know strong and those relationships strong. Um, I recognize that the you know this Veritas decision does impact those relationships. Um, I'll just you know it's a fact and and we recognize that that's it, it's not great. 
it destroys trust, which I understand. is something that needs to be accounted for. Hello, this is Waterway uh, 5. We have two people that had questions that were waiting very patiently. They are now in Waterway 4, probably standing at mics. Can we please get their questions answered? They are here. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Alexander Kling, Purdue University. I was wondering if headquarters is has any plans or what that what it looks like for investing in the upcoming fiscal years and in the infrastructure into uh, curation and storage of the return samples from Artemis 3 and the following return sample missions after Artemis 3 and what those plans look like. Okay, that's a good question. Um, and I don't know if that's a Joel question or a Sarah question. Is that something you would like to maybe? I'm gonna ask Sarah, who's our, our no, chief Kathleen lunatic. Kathleen isn't here, but she is the curation. Oh, Kathleen, <laughs> that's true. Kathleen, is Kathleen here? Kathleen here? Here she okay, comes. She Come there up front, go. Kathleen. Kathleen is our curation, one of our curation leads at headquarters. Hi. Uh, yes, that's a great question. Um, it's something we're constantly talking about. So um, Kathleen Vanderkaden, I'm the new lead uh, for curation at NASA headquarters. So this is another thing we work very closely with our uh, lunar partners, with, with Sarah and her team, PSD, SEO. Um, the current plan for Artemis 3 is the samples will go in with the Apollo samples from the same planetary body collected under the same conditions. And in our budget plans for the out years, we are incorporating um, plans for the later Artemis missions in there. Happy to chat more. So is there space for all those upcoming missions after? We're working on it. <laughs> Hi, John Christoph, Smithsonian. So I'll keep this brief because we're close to the end, but NASA has been through several government shutdowns in many previous years. Yeah. We're faced with something much worse very soon. So is there a contingency plan for if the US goes into default at headquarters or agency <laughs> level? And if not, what does that look like for us as compared to previous shutdowns? Well, that's a really big question. And <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm going to address the the shutdown part of that. I mean, that's something we've been through before. Um, as far as the default, good heavens, let's hope that doesn't happen because that's going to impact many things much more broadly than NASA and our science. That's our whole country, and the that's a that's a big deal. Um, shutdowns um, are never fun. Uh, they, you know, hopefully and and fortunately, a large part of the community continue working, and we try to make sure that people have the funding that they need for several months. Um, in the event that that the that we get shut down and we can't send you new money, uh, we try and do that. Um, of course, the NASA centers all get um, closed down. We're not allowed to answer email and things like that. Um, but uh, the the biggest challenge, you know. Even probably more so than the than the shutdowns is the delay that we have in getting the the funding. And so, you know, when we have funding situations where we really, you know, are are hoping for additional funding to support all of the portfolio that we have, the the delay that we have in in appropriation is a is a pretty big impact. Um, so, you know, those years where we have long long shutdowns or lots and lots of continuing resolutions makes it really challenging to work that. But Nancy. Uh, Nancy Chabot, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Um, since the community is very supportive of competed missions having a chance to fly, it sounds like Janice should maybe be on a path to have a chance to fly. Um, do you want to say what the options might be there? I was happy to see when you presented it this time, they were uh, no longer canceled, potentially. Um, are there options? Because it seems the like a competed mission- The situation hasn't changed you know? on Janice. Um, so the situation with Janice, as I said, they're not able to achieve the, the level one science um, with, the, with the current Psyche launch. So a, a launch on Psyche is not an option. They've been demanifest. The spacecraft are out at Lockheed Martin. Um, we've talked previously that um, the propulsion systems um, have some, some issues and are very, very high risk. Um, and so there's a question on, on whether or not uh, they're going to perform and whether, you know, how much more we should be investing in trying to get those spacecraft off the ground with, with uh, propulsion systems that um, are very high risk. 
Um, the other aspect is the, the team are actually, and I think I mentioned this before at the SBAG meeting, are off looking at some potential other science activities and looking for other potential rides. Um, and if they find something that looks compelling, we've told them that our door is open. They've still got additional funding um, as, that, they, um, you know, that we've already sent to them. Um, we said, go ahead and spend it, use it as you like um, to see what you can find. And if they come back with a compelling idea where we've said, we'll listen. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. You bet. Hi, I'm Alicia Joe to UCLA. I have a question about the Maston um, mission, the mm -hmm. CLIPS 19C. Um, what will happen to the instruments that were supposed to be on that lander? And is there a plan in case this happens again with another CLIPS lander? What will happen to the instruments on Maston 19C once the, the legal situation is resolved? Yep. Is they'll be remanifested for a future delivery mission to the moon? It might be a CLIPS landing. It might be to put those instruments on future international landings. It could be to fly them to the moon as part of human, uh, human landing system missions for Artemis. We've looked at several different options for that. And based on how we resolve this with, um, with how the Department of Justice is also with the company, um, those investigators will be notified of what the options are and which ones they'll likely be targeted to. Now, your question about what happens if this happens again, in effect, we'll react to it. If, if it were to happen again, we don't foresee it anything right now that would say it would happen again, but it's part of the experiment of what we're doing with commercial payload um, landing systems. I mean, the, we're partnering with companies. It's really difficult to uh, and challenging to land on the moon. Many of these companies just through, as we all did, went through years of dealing with COVID-19. Um, but I will tell you that I personally believe that our other um, landing um, missions are very, very strong. Thank you. We're, I'm going to ask for questions from the other room before we have one last Hello. question in this Hello. room. I, I came Hello, from those room. Bernard. I came okay. from the room that was closed. Oh. Okay. Uh, thank thank you. you. I'm Bernard Schweitzer. I'm, I'm the CEO of uh, Your Moon Mars and a director of International Moon Beta Alliance and former is our chief scientist. <laughs> and so we have a question as we are moving towards the Artemis era, Artemis generation. So we'll have to, to conduct much more integrated activities with uh, uh, astronauts from human bases. So um, how can we already prepare some of this research program with a community in places on Earth where we can build uh, uh, precursor rovers, uh, moon bases? And so is there laboratories so are there some facilities we could identify in the US and worldwide where we could conduct the type of uh, uh, analog simulation programs? And um, is there some uh, funding that could be earmarked in the years to come? So let me just make sure I'm understanding the question so I can direct it to the right person to answer it. Because I know it won't be me, but I don't know who in the room is the right person. Um, so you're, you're asking about um, analog research work or analog work to be done to prepare for human exploration yeah. on the moon or... or like yeah. building moon bases on Earth where we can really conduct so, they use research in Great, yeah. So there are some activities. Um, Sarah, is that something you want to talk to is some of the, the things that are ongoing? I think Jake is also maybe one that could speak to some of those, but maybe Sarah can go first and speak to some of the activities that are already ongoing to prepare. Yes, so we have a whole suite of analog activities happening. So there's some happening within planetary. We've got a couple of analog programs, uh, such as PSTAR that is is doing analog work around the world for various scientific purposes, including getting ready for humans. Uh, there's, there's a number of other um, things that, that we're doing through survey and through, through some of our uh, internal work, but NASA as an agency has a, has a, has a pretty broad uh, portfolio of analog activities that we've been ramping up over the last couple of years to get ready uh, for Artemis, including long-term studies on, on like, you know, nutrition and psychology and, and, and then more, you know, geology things like, like we did. If you come to the, the if you come to the analog to the Artemis town hall tomorrow, please do. Uh, we'll talk about some of the, some of the analogs we did last year, including a, a full up Artemis three analog uh, that we did jet three uh, over the summer to, to really sort of understand what we need uh, at least for these first few missions. And then there's also some looking ahead at like what, what we would do with pressurized rovers and, so we've got a number of activities happening across NASA. Jake, did, do you want to add anything? No. <laughs> come, come to the town hall tomorrow and we'll hear, we'll hear more. Have a question integrate the research uh, in these activities. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, if you, uh, 
Thank you. Uh, Hello, can I ask a quick question in the uh, other room? No, this is we're, quarter away five. I've only been waiting 20 minutes. <laughs> well, we just okay. asked and no one said anything well, from the other ballroom. The, the mic isn't working apparently. Okay. Now, now it's working. But I, I'm actually sorry, but we are at a, out of time uh, um, because we have to switch the room around for the next sessions. Uh, Feel free to catch us outside in the hall yeah. for any my, other additional questions. Yeah, my apologies. Uh, can we thank our headquarters colleagues? Thank <laughs> you. 